Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, O believers, be mindful of Allah. Be conscious of Allah. And let every soul reflect on what you have sent ahead for your afterlife. Let every soul reflect in order to act, in order to prepare for your afterlife. What taqullah, have taqwa of Allah. Have a sense of fear of violating the laws of Allah. Have mindfulness towards Allah. Be conscious of Allah. Fulfill His command. And Allah is aware of all that you do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live and die upon God consciousness and taqwa. Allahumma ameen. In the last two weeks, of course, most of our hearts and our minds have been with the situation in Palestine. But with it, of course, a number of questions would arise, a number of struggles that people are having to understand certain aspects, whether theological or historical. Why do Muslims believe what they believe? Why are we so passionate about Al-Aqsa of all things, even though... We are passionate about the causes of justice worldwide. We are passionate about Muslims in every land and place. We are passionate regardless of who is being oppressed that we defend them. But there's no doubt. Al-Aqsa and the situation in Palestine and the situation specifically in Gaza has brought about in the last two weeks unity amongst many people in the world from different walks of life, not just Muslims. From different walks of life, united in addressing a very clear injustice. But there is something else that has been happening for the last two weeks. And there's an intellectual war, a propaganda that has been funded and well-developed for decades, not just for the last two weeks. And I don't mean about the news cycle because we are aware of the propaganda with the news as certain things are happening and being hidden as the oppressed looks like the oppressor. No, that is not what I'm referring to. I am talking about an intellectual propaganda that has been prevalent in academia for a long time about the history of Palestine. And oftentimes when Muslims ask, what is the history of Palestine from our perspective? Why should we care? How can we summarize it? I will summarize it with three different stages, inshallah ta'ala, just for the sake of benefit. As for the first, and therefore I'm giving you a heads up, much of this khutbah, there is, yes, a lot of history involved, but there's a reason behind it. The first stage is from the first human being, Adam alayhi salam. Prophet Adam all the way to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know, to summarize, long story short, Prophet Adam alayhi salam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taught Islam to those who were with him, his family, and it spread through the generations. So the first human being, of course, submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is a Muslim. And it was said by many scholars that when you... Uh, read the hadith that the first masjid built, Masjid al-Haram, and then Masjid al-Aqsa, 40 years after that. Some scholars say perhaps it was built at the time of Adam alayhi salam, and eventually it was uh, destroyed and rebuilt by Ibrahim alayhi salam. And others say, we know for sure Ibrahim alayhi salam built it. We don't know if he was the first or if Adam was the first, but the point is what? It was the first masjid, Masjid al-Haram. 40 years later, Masjid al-Aqsa. Fast forward a number of generations, and you have, uh, of course, many prophets and messengers who uh, for them this was their homeland, the area of uh, Palestine, and it's a historical area of Palestine, I'm not talking about the nation state today. The area of Palestine, the area of uh, Bilad al-Sham, the general area of greater Syria, historically, there were many prophets and messengers in this land. But of course, specifically around Al-Aqsa, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to as a blessed or holy land in the Qur'an, there were some prophets and righteous people that we know of that this was their land, this was their home, that they fled to this land. And you have the example of Yaqub alayhi salam, you have the example of Maryam alayhi salam, you have Zakaria alayhi salam, later on Suleiman and Dawood alayhi salam. So we have many examples of this. When we talk about Bani Israel, which for another khutbah, another time, Bani Israel were at one point enslaved as they went to Egypt, they were enslaved by Fir'aun for many generations. And so as this took place, we know one of the objectives of Musa alayhi salam was actually to free Bani Israel. And of course with him you had a number of uh, followers, a number of believers, and some people later on went back to other things that they had done before in terms of misguidance. But long story short, you have the Babylonians who took over this area for a while. You have the Persians who took over the area for a while. You have the Romans all the way through uh, the time of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, fast forward to the fourth century. Between years 315 to 325, 
the Roman Emperor Constantine, who had converted to Christianity, Unita uh, Trinitarian Christianity. They had no longer now accepted Unitarian Christians. So now Jesus had a divine uh, status like God or part of God. So this became Trinitarian Christianity. Masjid al-Aqsa was not a respected place. It was disrespected. It was not, no longer a place of worship. And during this time, there were many fluctuations, as many scholars, historians have stated, in which even Jews themselves were not allowed to worship, were not allowed to enter certain areas of Jerusalem. This took place for a while. So generally speaking, during the Roman Byzantine Empire, for the next several hundred years, it was primarily Christian-run, and there was a lot of discrimination towards Judaism or Jews, and of course other people who had uh, tried to worship in the land, but it's primarily uh, Jewish Christianity and later on Islam. Now, there's this, this weird talking point that many people have been asking about. Whose land is this? Are we talking about a claim of 3,000 years? Is that really the argument of what's happening today with 75 years of occupation? Is that really the issue here when 1,500 children are being killed? When there's a clear blockade? When multiple international laws have been violated? Is that really the only issue here? Because if we wanted to play that game, it's a very easy game to play. If we were talking about history itself, and that's how you know who should be living in the land and in control of the land, the world itself, the country we're in right now, would be a very different place, a very different land. We are talking about the groups that were there historically, the Canaanites and others, of course. Later on, we, we descend, many people descend from the Canaanites. Uh, Arabs and Jews and others have shared ancestry. But that's not the issue here. Because although Bani Israel, although some of the uh, Jews historically came after Prophet Ibrahim السلام, this is not really the issue here, the historical claim. Because if we were to play that game, all we have to say from the Islamic perspective is Muslims were there first, Adam السلام, Ibrahim السلام, and many other prophets and messengers. But that's not the issue here. The issue here is what happened from the 1800s or 1900s onward, which we'll get to in a moment inshallah ta'ala. So this is from the time of Adam. السلام, all the way to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa At this last point, it was under the Byzantine or the uh, Christian state. Part two is at the time of the Prophet والسلام, Now there's history here, but there's also fada'il al-aqsa. There's also the question that many Muslims have been asking us in the last two weeks. Why does this seem, amongst all the causes we advocate for, to be something that Muslims are so passionate about? Is there a religious context? Yes, Absolutely. When we talk about the religious context, we say first and foremost, it is a place in which some wahi came down, revelation came down. It is the home of many prophets and messengers. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam prayed towards Al-Aqsa for many years. In fact, according to Al-Bukhari, one of the reports from uh, Al-Bara radiallahu an, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam prayed in that direction until they migrated uh, about 16 or 17 months after the migration. 16 or 17 months after the migration, the revelation came down to change towards the Kaaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it in the Quran as a blessed land. In one of the verses specifically, muqaddas, as a holy land. Ya qawmi dkhulu al-arda al-muqaddasata allati katab Allahu lakum in Surah Al-Ma'idah. So it is a holy land, it is a blessed land from a theological perspective. You know the beginning of uh, Surah Al-Isra and the story of Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, the night journey and the ascension. One of the most interesting things about this, and obviously it deserves its own khutbah, is when you look at the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the miracle that he gave to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, subhanallahi asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa alladhi barakna hawla. Masjid al aqsa is being referenced here uh, explicitly amongst four masajid in the Quran. Alladhi barakna hawla. There is baraka, blessing around it. Meaning what? It's not just Al-Aqsa, it's the area around it as well. Now, here, this refers to something of an interesting wisdom that many Muslims were asking about. Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ, why wasn't he just ascended into the heavens from Mecca? Why did Allah transport him to Jerusalem in a miracle that you cannot explain with, obviously, the laws of nature? This is an example of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created the laws of nature, changing them to show the veracity of prophethood. Why? So one of the wisdoms many scholars say, the Prophet wasallam, if he had ascended directly from Mecca, they, they either would believe or disbelieve based on what they already know of him, meaning they already have a stance. But when he's transported to Bayt al-Maqdis, now they can ask him a question. They know he's never been there. Describe it for us. Describe Masjid al-Aqsa for us, or the, the area around it for us. The Prophet wasallam described it. And this was a proof that he had seen it, that he was transported to it. 
And there were people who were actually traveling back, traveling from Beit al-Maqdis to Mecca. And some of the locals asked them, what did you see along the way? Or describe what some of the things that he has said. And it affirmed that what he said was true. So now that they know that he was transported in one night and back, which you cannot do at that time, now they know that he's telling the truth, they would also believe what? Yes, he ascended to the heavens. There's a wisdom behind it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu this blessing and all of us, the blessing of salah, the way to liberate yourself, the key to Jannah, the first thing we're asked about, the reason that our hearts can stay consistently nourished with five prayers a day, prescribed during Al-Isra wal miraj during this journey, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led the prophets in prayer. And it was there in Bayt al-Maqdis that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led them in prayer. You know the virtues of the three main masajid in Islam, Masjid al-Haram, the prayers of which are 100,000 times the reward, Masjid al-Nabawi a thousand times, and in an authentic hadith, uh, Masjid al-Aqsa has one-fourth of that reward. There's a weak hadith about 500, one-fourth of the reward of Masjid al-Nabawi, so 250 times the reward. The point is not the specific number, the point is that it is multiplied because it is an important place in Islam. In addition to this, of course, Prophet Sulaiman made a specific dua. This is an authentic hadith. He made a specific dua that whoever enters this masjid and prays, the intention for entering is just to pray. He made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives this person like the day that they were born. And yukhrijahu min khati'atihi kayawmi waladatu ummuhu, as is reported by an Nisa'i. So the Prophet sallallahu is telling us about the dua of Sulaiman alayhi salam. He made three supplications. This was the third supplication. It's a reminder for us there is virtue in this masjid for Muslims. It is obviously one of the three masajid you are allowed to travel to in terms of the religious intention. And at the end of times, it is the place that Ad-Dajjal, the Antichrist, cannot enter. You have Mecca, Medina, and of course Al-Aqsa, and you have another report uh, about a, a fourth place as well uh, in uh, Egypt. But the point is that this is a place that is protected spiritually. Ad-Dajjal will not be able to enter, and he will be killed in a nearby place by Isa alayhi salam. Fast forward one more time, one more thing about the virtues here. That it is, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ardul Mahshar wal Manshar. It is the place of gathering and resurrection. What this means exactly and how the area is transformed for the day of judgment, we don't obviously know, but we know that it holds a very dear place to us in our hearts. Now, the Prophet ﷺ left this world and trained the companions and taught the companions and gave them the message of Islam. And during the reign of Umar radiallahu an, Umar radiallahu an was the second of the khulafa of the righteously uh, guided. Umar radiallahu an, when he entered and Jerusalem was liberated, he allowed the Jews to enter and to worship although they had been banned by the Christians for many centuries. He allowed the Christians to worship. He allowed the Jews to worship. And he gave a speech, a covenant. The, uh, the, it's known as the Ahd of Umar radiallahu an that inspired many people in the Christian Byzantine Empire to have a society of people of different religions and to give them their rights of worship. To allow the Christians to worship, the Jews to worship, and the Muslims to worship as well. And... For a long time, this was the case in Jerusalem. For a long time, people were able to worship as they wanted. For a long time, there was religious tolerance amongst different people when Muslims were in power. So this assurance of Umar radiallahu an inspired many Christians to also consider the same in their societies because the Christians were feeling like there's oppression from their own rulers. And when they feel this way and a Muslim comes along and gives people rights, they start to respect that more. And it was in fact a form of da'wah many people had become Muslim. Fast forward a few decades uh, in year 690, 691, 692, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, one of the rulers of the time, commissioned the building of the building that many Muslims see today and they think that's Al-Aqsa and it is the Dome of the Rock. When you look at the Golden Dome uh, Mosque, basically, when you look at it and assume this is Masjid Al-Aqsa, you recognize it is a beautiful structure. It is on the sanctuary of Masjid Al-Aqsa. I mean, it's on the area, the land of Masjid Al-Aqsa. So it's a part of it. If you pray in it, you are praying in the uh, Saha, in the general area of Masjid Al-Aqsa. But that is not the actual Aqsa Mosque that we are talking about, the structure itself that many Muslims uh, have visited, alhamdulillah. Fast forward, fast forward almost 400 years. The Crusades took place in year 1099. You know the Crusades, you know how brutal they were. It was one of the darkest times in the history of that region. And of course, many Muslims who were actually looking for safety and security in the masjid, and also, also many Jews in the synagogue were butchered, were killed, were massacred by the Crusaders. And this took place. The control of the uh, Christian Empire took place for almost 88 years until, of course, Salah al-Din Ayyubi, rahimahullah, with many of the factors that uh, facilitated the liberation of Al-Aqsa, Salah al-Din Ayyubi, rahimahullah, it was in September or October of, of year 1187, 
almost 800, almost 850 years ago to the month. The Salah al-Din Ayyubi rahimahullah, during these expeditions, multiple cities, of course, is making dua, is making dhikr. They're praying Qiyamul Layl, surrounded himself, not just with generals and wise people and strategizers, but they were people of the Qur'an. They stayed away from temptations. They stayed away from haram. During the night before the liberation of Al-Aqsa, you would see some of them praying, some of them reading Qur'an, some of them in dhikr and dua, and yes, perhaps some of them resting as well. But it was a group of people who were also righteous, not just strategists, not, not people who were just politically savvy. And as Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahimullah entered, of course, you know the story, many of you, that he was able to say, you know what? Yes, as you did to us, we want to kill all of the crusaders and their children. He didn't do that. Salah al-Din Ayyubi rahimullah was seen with a lens of justice, similar to how some people saw uh, centuries earlier, Umar radiallahu anhu, obviously in a different uh, way, a different uh, lens, but they saw that there was some justice, that he allowed the Christians who wanted to leave, to leave. That he allowed those who wanted to worship, to worship. And once again, for a long time after this, for actually almost eight centuries under uh, different types of Muslim dynasties or Islamic dynasties, you had the ability for Jews, Christians, and Muslims to worship, and there was no injustice towards those three groups from one another. They were allowed to worship as they wanted to worship in this blessed land, a land that they all consider to be important. For us, we say, as many people are asking about Salah al-Din Ayyub, it's very problematic when we're constantly asking, where is the next Salah al-Din? as though we ourselves are not responsible to facilitate everything that is good for the ummah, to raise our children to also be righteous in the ummah. And this, this comes through very difficult action and sacrifice, more than just words. We want the ummah to be in a better place. We want the three masajid to be in a good place. We want Masjid al-Aqsa to be liberated from occupation. We want that. But are we willing to go through the hard work of emphasizing to our children and for us to be role models, to walk the walk, to actually raise the standard of learning about Islam, to emphasize that it's not all about a dunya, it's not all about how much money you make, it's not all about prestige and where you live and what kind of car you have, that are we raising those standards of Islam for us to really deserve an elevated sense of status in the ummah because of our contributions? Obviously, every one of us is in a different place. So when we talk about the past, we're not talking so that we are living in the past or romanticizing history. There were a lot of very tough times. Salah al-Din Ayyubi rahmallah, we see in his time, yes, he was a person of justice. But he was also very firm and very strong. He was a person of peace, but he was very wise. He united the Muslims of different backgrounds for a long time. Something that we are in need of today. Salah al-Din Ayyubi rahmallah, there's a reminder as well in, in the history here that uh, things are not always black and white. Things are not always yes or no. Sometimes you have to compromise, sometimes you have to strategize, sometimes you have to uh, be diplomatic, sometimes you have to be flexible depending on where and when. Obviously, there's religious guidance with this. But at the end of the day, he was a person of vision. And there were factors that contributed to this. And he was one of many vehicles of goodness in history. And of course, we will see, inshallah ta'ala, in our times and in the future, a lot of vehicles of goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst them. Allahumma ameen. This brings us to the third and final stage. Why are we in the place that we are in today? How did things become like they are today? From the 1800s onwards. When we talk about the 1800s onwards, I'm trying to summarize uh, tens of thousands of pages, pages of like research and history and all of that into as many simplified elements as possible. First, there was the birth of Zionism. Zionism, what is it? So that we are all on the same page during these times. As Muslims, we should be aware of the different ideologies in the world. Zionism was and is a recent political nationalist movement with the aim of establishing a nation state in what is called historical Israel, historical Israel, or Palestine actually, as a homeland for the Jewish people in the current uh, Palestinian territory. I'm simplifying a lot more of what Zionism actually is because for those who know and you've studied it, you know there's a, a uh, in fact, an inherent contradiction in different strands of Zionism. It's not one type. There's a religious Zionism, a political, there's a Marxist, there's a, a conservative, a Republican. There are many different types of Zionism. And there are, of course, there's a distinction here that many people bring up between Zionism and Judaism. And this is important for us, even though we frequently said, as we've always stated, uh, Muslims are not anti-Semitic, Muslims are not anti-Judaism. This, this is not even really the issue. It's a distraction, but it's a very, very intentional distraction because there's a fusion of terms. There's a fusion of what it means to be both Jewish in terms of politics, as well as nationality, as well as culture, as well as identity, as well as your bloodline with a political nationalist movement. When we talk about Judaism, we're talking about the religion as Muslims. We are talking about the religion itself. Now, during the 1800s and 1900s, historically, we know, we're talking about Europe here, 
with the changes that people were seeing, that societies were seeing, the watering down and the changes of dynasties, it started to become what? There started to be an emphasis on having your own nation state. It was a different type of structure. With the desire to have a nation state, there were many Jews all across the world, similar to Muslims who have a concept of one ummah. We are one ummah regardless of the geographic borders and territories and your passport, that we are all one ummah. Look at our diversity just in one masjid. So there was an emphasis by many Jews, uh, amongst them the, one of the fathers of Zionism, Theodore Herzl, to have what is called a Jewish nationalist state. But the emphasis here when we talk about Zionism, and again, there were many criticisms, there are many strands, there are many other things that I, I don't have the time to cover. But generally speaking, there was an understanding that Jews, who were not always fully secure in Europe, who were not always given the same advantages, sometimes there was discrimination, sometimes there were issues, and of course, you had two things in particular that um, were a catalyst to wanting their own land, their own place. Well, the first was the uh, Dreyfus Affair, and the second was the Holocaust itself, which affected a lot of people, and yes, affected a lot of Jews as well. There's no doubt whatsoever that to have a separate land, a nation state, while lands are being distributed now, seems like a good opportunity for a lot of people. And it was not strange, it was not foreign to assume that amongst all the options in the world, that the historic area of uh, Palestine is the place in which the three religions, again, have some love towards, have some significance towards. And this includes, again, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. The British, uh, sorry, the Zionist movement was given some amplification through the British powers that at the time were in control of what was called the British Mandate for Palestine. You have the Balfour Declaration in 1917, you have Muslims and, and Arabs, and you have Christians and Palestinian Jews as well, who are not always for having a new state come in and create this, uh, this new uh, nation state, these borders of a Zionist state, while there were people who lived in that land. And the people who lived in that land had lived in that land for several generations before. Again, remember, uh, until, until all of this happened, World War I, you basically had Muslim rule with different dynasties for almost 800 years, 400 or 500 of which was under the Ottoman Empire. So this was a very huge change. Obviously, there was resistance to the idea from the get-go. There were many people who didn't agree with it. There were many Jews who were against it. There are many Jews who are against Zionism today in one of its forms. And so when this happened, they came to Palestine, the area of Palestine. They found there were already people here. And the overwhelming majority, more than 90%, are Arab Palestinians. And the overwhelming majority of the Arabs were Muslim. There are Christians, of course, no doubt. There was a small population of Jews, approximately 50 to 60,000. They were about 5% of the native Palestinian Jews. So the majority here, you have what? You have Muslims, you have Arabs, you have Palestinians whose parents and grandparents and ancestors had been there for many generations. So obviously, th this is not uh, a matter of just one entity or one factor. It's very complicated in the sense that a lot of things happen at the same time. In 1947, with Britain now trying to pass this resolution of having an Arab-Palestinian state and having a, a Jewish state, uh, in fact Israel, uh, which again is not always the same as Judaism, obviously they passed this over to the UN because the Brits themselves, the soldiers were attacked, sometimes by Zionists, sometimes by uh, other locals. So they left it to the UN and the UN decided to give uh, the, the, uh, the, the Zionists the state of Israel. So this happened while there was resistance. Now they said to the locals, they said to the Palestinians with different councils and different movements, what about compromising and giving up just 50%, approximately 50% of this land and having two states? And of course they disagreed because if we own this land and you're going to take 50% of the land and also we are 90% of the population, they disagreed for many reasons and I'm simplifying here. They disagreed. Later on you have in 1948 the war that broke out obviously with a lot of atrocities committed by many Zionists, many extremists, many radicals who killed and they butchered and they massacred many locals and many soldiers as well. You have them now taking 75 to 80% of the land and 85% of Jerusalem. Fast forward again another two decades, 1967, another war, another number of atrocities occupying now all of pretty much East Jerusalem and claiming the unity of Jerusalem as one. So we fast forward with all of these incidents that took place, we're finding what? The more, the more there is a claim of a two-state solution, the more there's a claim that we're not trying to take over the natives' land, the Palestinians who were there, the 90% who were uh, messed up and destroyed and massacred in their homes, in their villages in 1948 with the catastrophe of kicking out and expelling so many Palestinians. No, now it was a matter of how do we take more and also stay strong and weaken those who are trying to build for anything else. You have, of course, a lot of other history that took place all the way to year 2000 with the Intifada and the second as well after that. But let's talk about today just to bring us to the present. Over one million people displaced. There are only two million people in Gaza. Half of them are under the age of 15. What kind of nation state in the world justifies 
and funds and what kind of people support the attacks, the carpet bombing, the destruction of buildings. And yes, the hospital as well, many other hospitals. It's not a surprise. There's a propaganda war. What kind of nation state do you have to be morally to justify a collective punishment and war crimes and white phosphorus and everything else on top of everything that has already been done, not for just 15 years in Gaza, but for 75 years in that land? How can you justify this from a moral lens? other than to say we feel we deserve it. We feel this is our land. We feel this is the land that we want to support and sponsor and fund as a government. We're talking here about the U.S. foreign policy. So when we see what is happening, 3,000 people who are killed, over 3,000 in the last uh, week and a half, 1,500 children. Where is all this commotion of the few babies that people were talking about in the beginning, those babies that were killed like this or killed like that? That's not the issue here. No Muslim is okay with innocent uh, civilians dying. No Muslim is okay with babies being killed at all. This is not allowed in Islam. But we're way past that. It's a distraction. Are we okay talking about the children that have been killed for the last 75 years? Are we ready to talk about this and change this situation? Because it's all tied in together. There is a structural violence that is taking place. Now, I've had a lot of Muslims ask me in the last few days, are we nationalist as Muslims? Are we supposed to be talking about the flag of Palestine when the flag itself is not a religious thing? Why are Muslims seeming like they are so nationalistic with Palestine? This is not an issue of nationalism. Yes, we believe in la ilaha illallah. This is, the, this is what unites us at the end of the day. You are not superior if you're from Yemen or Pakistan or India or Syria or Palestine. No, no, this is not a matter of superiority or dividing Muslims at all. No, no, we are not nationalists. However, having said that, Al-Aqsa and what surrounds it is important to us as Muslims. The second point is that Palestine, before Zionism, was predominantly a Muslim land. Predominantly a Muslim land. For over eight centuries, a Muslim land. And that's just from the time of Salah al-Din Ayyubi, rahimahullah. Obviously, historically, with the many prophets and messengers, it was a Muslim land. And the third thing to keep in mind is that as this gradual theft is happening, there is a very clear injustice that is taking place. This is a matter of justice for us as well. There are many other reasons, but at the end of the day, the heart of the believer is with others who are suffering. So of course, we care about the situation in Palestine. Of course, this is not a nationalistic issue, but we believe as Muslims were there, we believe as this is a matter of injustice, that we have to speak up, that we have to condemn, that we have to study, that we have to raise awareness, and that we have to be involved. How many more Palestinians have to be killed, or homes destroyed, or mosques completely bombed as well? for people to finally say this is a, an issue that needs to be stopped now. How many more things need to happen? What are we waiting for? What is the world waiting for? What are politicians waiting for? What is the president waiting for? What are the lobbies waiting for? How many more Palestinians have to die for somebody to finally say, okay, we're satisfied with how many Palestinians have been killed every single year for the last 75 years. This didn't start two weeks ago. This started 75 years ago. And before 75 years ago, this started with the birth of Zionism knowing that there were people living in that land, knowing there were families that had lived there for generations. And many of us here and many people around the world descend from parents that were born in Palestine, born in cities that had been displaced in 1948. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Palestine, in Al-Aqsa, and all around the world, in every land and every place. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilize us for their relief and for justice. Allahumma ameen. Ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the offer giving the ever merciful. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We mentioned we, had a, we have a weekly Wednesday class here for the entire community, a weekly series, a lecture on the topic of reviving the ummah. We welcome and invite everyone to join us inshallah ta'ala. We spoke about the topic of tawakkul, to trust in Allah. To trust in Allah, this is tested when you see an atrocity, when you see a hardship, when you see an occupation for so long. And there are certain things that contribute to your ability to be resilient and strong for the sake of your brothers and sisters to spread optimism and hope while there's tragedy and pain. And at times it is simultaneous. At times they are intertwined. That you are accepting the qadr that has passed, but you're not accepting the injustice that is happening, meaning what? You're trying to change the situation. In the most, one of the most common, famous hadith, whoever sees an evil should try to change it with their hands. If you cannot change it with your hands, then your speech, your advocacy, your text, your social media, everything you can do in terms of speech. If you cannot even say anything, and most people can, if you cannot do anything at all in terms of advocacy and speech, then you hate that evil in your heart, and that is the least degree of faith. 
That you're not going about your day thinking, well, it's, ah, it's just another day in Palestine. Yes, it's another day in Palestine, another day of killing, another day of occupation, a blockade, checkpoints, and so on and so forth, starving two million people to death, preventing humanitarian aid from entering. Yes, that is the situation. How can you possibly say you're not affected by it? Our hearts are with our brothers and sisters in Palestine and in every land and every place around the world. To summarize some action items, make sure while all of this is happening and people are protesting and you are learning about the history, make sure you are also making a lot of sincere dua. Do not belittle the power of dua. Turn to salah. The Prophet ﷺ would pray more in times of atrocity and calamity. Sta'inu bi sabri wa salah. Number two, we have a great, great motivation and need and responsibility to learn, learn, learn about the situation and to teach and to spread awareness because there's a massive intellectual propaganda that has been ongoing for several decades to revise history. And, the third, and by the way, this includes social media. Every single post, every share, all of these things do make a difference. This has impacted a lot of campaigns around the world. And the third and the last is to strategize. What is your life about with the short time that you are here? You may or may not see a free Palestine in your life. You may or may not see Masjid al-Aqsa liberated from occupation. But at least while you are here, you know that you did your part. You committed to the process. There were people in those 88 years from the Crusades all the way to Salah al-Din Ayyubi rahimahullah who contributed to the factors, the facilitation of what would come next, but they did not live to see it. And they will have a share of that reward. What are you going to do while you are here for the different causes of justice all around the world? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of our brothers and sisters. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide us and guide others through us.